Verse 25. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believe it. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. And many other signs truly that Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Amen. Believe it or not, you may have heard a pattern and all 10 of these sets of verses are all from the book of John, the gospel according to John. There are many, many more. Many of you who have read your Bible know that Romans is chock full, so is the book of Acts, and really almost every book in the New Testament. Um, there is a pattern here. There's over 100 uh, justified by faith alone verses in the Bible. And I encourage you to keep reading, but I hope that this encourages you to just believe on Jesus. Don't do any works. You don't have to pray. You don't have to invite God into your heart. You don't have to confess. You certainly don't have to turn from your sins. It's not even what repent means. And I just pray that you that you believe on Jesus and Him alone. And you should, will be saved. Amen. So I ask you one last time, will you go to heaven when you die? Amen. This is my question to you. Do you believe Jesus when He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Brother To start out with saying that we want to, if we can go ahead, I'll be using Second Peter versus just start the first one. We would like to turn to Second Peter chapter three. That's where we're going to hold our our message today. I want to say that before I get into my message, that we're all praying for our pastor, Amen. myself and my family. You know, we were away, and it was hard to receive that kind of news when we're away, knowing that we can't immediately be there. I know my dad was yeah. nearly ready to clock out our hotel room Wednesday night, <laughs> head straight back here for the congregation. But we're happy. Yeah, it's a blessing that the signs are looking like he's going to make a good recovery for himself, yeah. that he's getting great treatment, that Lord willing, you know, he'll be back in here before, what do you say, minimum of two weeks. Yeah, That'd be wonderful. Amen. Um, I would also like to say that this message is not one that I have had an amazing amount of time to prepare. As a, as a matter of fact, it, the subject came to me mostly this morning and I just tried to build it from there. I know I'm, we're not uh, worried about time with our three preachers so much. You know, the three will make up for our pastors one. And we need even more we need only even more than three of us to, to keep up the burden he's holding. Amen. That's for sure. But I uh, I'm bringing this message. I got it ready. I think that it is what God wants me to preach today. Amen. And but because he wants me to preach it, if it's a train wreck, blame me. <laughs> Don't blame God. God's perfect. I'm not. Amen. Amen. Being born again did not make me perfect. Amen. Amen. Uh, if we have our places, Second Peter chapter 3, I'm asking all that are willing and able to stand in reverence for the reading of the Word of God. Amen. All right. Our scripture read, reads, chapter 3, verse 1. 
This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are for this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. My a couple seconds of reading just shows me that's like a that's a more in-depth way of saying that if you can believe that God created the heavens and the earth and created our entire universe, believe in his words when he says he's going to come again comes easy, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> but that's not my point for this message. Verse 7. But the and well uh, verse 8. But beloved, be ignorant uh, be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. <coughs> the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Our text verse is going to be chapter 9, or verse 9, which reads, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, all things considered, I am thankful for a night, another stepping stone to walking in, walking in what you'd have me to do. I pray that if nothing else comes out of this service besides bumbling words, it'll be humbling, and it'll be another step. But for the words I do bring, I pray that you bless them. I pray that I speak what you would have me to speak, Amen. that I wouldn't grieve the Holy Spirit in any way, and that it would resonate and bless this congregation as they receive it. Lord, I pray you watch over me and give me power to preach what you would have me to do. In Jesus' holy name I pray and thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 So, according to a Google search overall that lasted no longer than three minutes and over a couple searches, I only clicked one link because whatever pops up in the first box is where I get my answer. Um, there are 8.2 billion, roughly 8.2 billion people alive today. Allegedly, 2.63 billion are professing Christians. Naturally, we can cut a lot of that number when we consider the world considers confessing Christians, Catholics, Calvinists, Mormons, yeah. Amen. professing Christians, maybe born again, likely not. Yeah, amen. But, but apparently, with all this, with all these people that are in the world today, 8.2 billion, apparently, 170,790 people die each day. 7,116 per hour, 119 per minute, and. That gets us about to 1.98 every second. And I'm going to title this message, Somebody is Going to Die Tonight. Alternatively, I could have named this message, 500 people have died since I got up here, and the number's right. still going up. Amen. Right? Wow. But I want to start off by saying that people die in a lot of different ways at a lot of different times. The methods of death are hardly consistent. You know, we've seen, you know, same kind of car crashes, people walk out okay, people bump into a wall and even their spines messed up for the rest of their life. The, the means of death, which are surely controlled and not surprising to our Lord at all. But the point is, is that there's a lot of different ways that death can become us. That death approaches, death can take us, death, <clears throat> death sweeps. One thing is that what happens after death is very predictable. What happens after death is very consistent. You either meet Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, 
or you meet the Father at the great white throne of judgment, Amen. roughly. <clears throat> and, but on top of that, you know, on the topic of death, praise God, me and my family and one of my friends, or a couple of my friends, you know, we just got back from vacation, and we're back here tonight. Praise God for that. I'm happy, Amen. you know. We're driving long ways, two ways, eight hours, six hours. A couple of my friends drove more than 12 hours, you know. And during those long car rides, you're in a metal death box rolling at 70 miles per hour at a time. <laughs> and one, one fatal mistake can quickly turn that around. It's, and it's definitely a thought. It's definitely a thought to have to yourself, you know. Multiple times I caught myself thinking, well, Lord, I pray that... We get, we get back safely. I pray that you continue to watch over us for this ride. And that's my out loud prayer, but inside I'm thinking, and if I die, I pray that by all means, that was your will for some reason. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, uh, I'm on his time, not my own. Amen. Regardless. Amen. So, <clears throat> and sometimes, you know, we don't think we're ready, but from a Christian point of view, it's not looking towards death. It's not a terrible thing. No, it's not. A lot of people are rather waiting for it, you know, as grim as that might sound. I mean, we noticed Paul had suicidal, you know, suicidal tendencies, not necessarily because he was depressed and was hurting himself, but because we're not going to know a greater glory and a greater happiness than being with our Father in Heaven, Amen. 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 which is truly wonderful. That's right. Amen. But my point is, is that death sweeps and comes rapidly, unexpectedly, yeah, yeah. and you know a good ending is on that is uh, we die by natural causes at the ripe old age of 70. I say 70 because some people have reached past that and they're wishing they were gone at 70. <laughs> but, Amen. But it's also it's also easy to ignore that feeling of death every day walking by because statistically speaking. I have a 100% chance of waking up tomorrow because I've never died before. Amen. Amen. Statistically Amen. speaking, I've got a good run. Amen. <laughs> but, and, but my point is, you know, maybe I'll strike that 0% and I'll never see Monday morning. That's right. And if nothing else, I'm thankful that I'm saved. Amen. Amen. That very Amen. But I want to go into my first point. And... I hope I paint this image into you that many people are dying. It rapidly comes. It unexpectedly comes from ripe old ages to before we even exit the womb. Death comes in any of those forms. Right. So really, every single day is a blessing because you made it to the next day. Amen. Amen. You have That's another right. day to do God's will. You have another day to please your Lord and Savior. That's right. And we don't look at it that way, but and that's not my point right now. But my point is, is we should reach the harvest before it withers. Amen. I'm going to go to Matthew 9:37, and you don't have to turn with me if you don't want to. But Matthew 9:37 reads, <clears throat> "Then saith he unto his disciples, Jesus, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few." That's true. We've heard that preached here before. You know, we're a very soul-winning oriented church, at least our pastor is, very soul-winning focused. And when we, in the very next verse, Jesus prays for laborers, you know, you say, or he has a commandment to pray for laborers. We are the laborers in question that we're praying for. You know, it's a little, unless you're unable to get up in the morning due to one reason or another, if you're able to walk and you're, if you're able to talk and you're able to praise and you're able to recite, Amen. You can get up and you can go Amen. do as God wants you to do. Amen. It's it's a blessing Amen. that I have that privilege. Amen. It's easy to take our legs for granted. And I work in a hospital. And y'all have seen me bring in um, a fellow that I met there. You know, Brother Aaron sits over here when he when we were able to get him to church. Yep. And he's paralyzed with the legs down. Mm -hmm. And you know, every day is just about pain for him. And he has health issues. And health issues. And we're going to pray for him, and we believe that God can still use that. Amen. Yeah. But the point yeah. is, as far as I can tell, none of us in this room have that issue. Yeah. You know? Amen. Yeah. And you may have other issues that might keep you from doing so, and I'm not going to say that all of them are justified. 
But I will say that to the grand majority of us, we can work while the harvest is plenteous. Amen. Amen. What I also want to put into perspective is that not only is the harvest ready for our taking and we're praying for ourselves as laborers, it's our job to do so. Amen. We have a responsibility as Christians not just to be saved. God saved us to bring us into heaven. That's true, but that's not the only reason we're saved. We are saved to go forth and get other people saved. Amen. Amen. We're, we're saved to, yep. to act. You know, we're Christians. We're defined as a peculiar people. We have, we're told to act a certain way, dress a certain way, be a certain way, speak a certain way. But most important of all, we're uh, told to go and spread the gospel of Jesus. Amen. That's yeah. right. Amen. Amen. And that's one of my points is what I'm thinking here is you start off and there's the people you don't know. And it might be the you might be people that, you know, you just want to talk to. It might be easy. Say it, stop by and invite them to church. But if you felt to pull in to talk to somebody, I would say you probably ought to talk to them. Yeah. But in a perspective, and which I'm plenty guilty for this, you know, I pass up people at the hospital that I might see and go by, you know, I felt like I might, I, maybe I should have said something. Yeah, but chances are, I'm never going to see that person again. Mm -hmm. Chances right. are, I'm going to spend the, my next time until I forget that person existed, wondering, I wonder where that person is now. I wonder if they were saved in the first place. I wonder if they didn't get into a horrible car crash on the way home and wake up at the, at the great white throne and... Just because I didn't stop to talk to that person, they, on my on blood on my hands, and I'm not saying that they didn't have chances beforehand. I'm sure there's, you know, God is righteous. That person deserves to be in hell. But they deserved a chance. What did Jesus die for if we don't spread the gospel? Amen. What did Jesus die for if we're not fulfilling that message, fulfilling that uh, requirement, not requirement, but responsibility Amen. to bring it out to the world. And that's what I'm saying. Amen. Is you might never see that person again, and they very well, death comes swiftly, it comes rapidly. Yes. They might have not even seen the next hour after you let him be. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, whether that this theoretical person, very real person, I'm sure a, a few of us have a situation in mind where we've done exactly this, but that person could very well be gone. Yeah. And I want to take that time and I want to expand on the on the imagery of us being laborers sent into the harvest. And I want to expand on the harvest. And I want to point you to remember the time when you were in the harvest. Amen. You Amen. were not saved from birth. That's right. You had to hear the word of God sometime in your life. And Amen. You were blessed enough to receive that message and let it change your life, you saved people. You know, if you're unsaved, then, well, you know, consider letting yourself be right for the picking. Yeah, come and get it. Yeah. Amen. yeah. But that's my point, is you were once upon the harvest, and you can probably pinpoint the time you were plucked up off the ground and preserved forever, sealed forever for the rest of your life. Uh, you were born twice and you only die once. Amen. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. And you remember that time that you were saved and you can pinpoint it. I'm sure you can pinpoint somebody that led you to Christ. Amen. You know, maybe some, you know, maybe sometimes people get led on a track or something. Maybe it's an Amen. item. I mean, somebody left it and you can think about that person. But for a lot of us here, we were led by a talking, breathing soul that in our eyes saw, saw a dead man walking, living on this earth, destined for eternal hellfire. And I wanna, I wanna point out some of this imagery. I, wanna, I remember the first time I heard the gospel. I don't believe this was the time I got saved, but I remember the first time I heard the gospel. Um, I was at my grandparents' house and it was none other than my grandfather sitting here on the second row he, uh, he pulled me, my brother, and at the time, my three stepbrothers aside. And, you know, we were all, none of us had really, pro probably none of us had hit double digits by this point. But, and, you know, we're all tots. 
and he pulls us into his room and preaches to us the gospel. Now, like I said, I don't believe I got saved at that point. I believe I got saved later in my life. But for one, I can recognize that if nothing else, a seed had been planted. If nothing else, a seed had been planted Amen. that and that my grandfather got to see blossom, that my grandfather got to see sprout. He got to see me become ripe for the taking. And you got to think about it at his point. He is the theoretical laborer sitting to this harvest. He's looking at his family. He sees five young boys. Then, as far as he knows, all of them, once they reach the age of accountability, are destined for eternal hellfire. He sees doom. He sees death. He sees a second death. And yeah. it's in his heart, his burden, I'm sure over his tears at some point, that he wants to see his grandkids get saved. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. And... <clears throat> And God bless, later in life I got saved. Amen. And now, Amen. and that, that's going to push in. I want, I want to put you as the laborer again. You're no longer the harvest. Thank God you're a Christian. Thank God you're saved. Thank God you're born again. And thank God you have the ability to do the work that you can do today. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I want to say, <laughs> now, when we put ourselves into the harvest, and you know what, sometimes it's hard because... You know, we're told from receiving the, when we become saved, that when we're led through the gospel, that we shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know, it's my strength. Amen. Romans 1.18, I couldn't recite it for the life of me right now. But the gospel of Christ is our strength. To all that believes, it's our strength. Amen. And Amen. we shouldn't be ashamed. And man, if only shame ended with being saved. Yeah. If only that was the case. Because I know... Every time I feel like I need to talk to somebody, I feel ashamed. I'm ready for, you know, to, I'm ready to get, I'm ready, to, I'm nearly ready to get punched in the face, you know? <laughs> Just for somebody even implying that they're not perfect, for even implying that they're in need of a Savior, that they don't recognize that they need right now. Amen. But... Maybe it's different outside. Maybe it's different. What about your loved ones? Tell me. Are you, are you confident in the, sal in the salvation of your wife, in the salvation of your husband, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, your niece, nephew, grandchildren, and if you're fortunate or young enough, your own parents? You know, our pastor talks about how he got saved before his dad, and he burdened, wept over his father for many, many years, and... Thank God he was able to get that man, or watch him become a Christ-believing Christian one day. But you got to look at your family, and, you know, they know you. They know the worst parts of you. They know the things you've done. They've grown up with you. And they couldn't possibly think that, I'm not going to let someone like him talk to me that way. I know what he did. I know what she did. I know what they do in their free time, and you might not still be perfect. Amen. I mean, you're That's definitely not perfect. Amen. If you are perfect, then please raise your hand and then put it down because you lied. <laughs> <laughs> so, Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen, Pastor. Amen. <laughs> so we look at our family. We look at the people that we love the most. And I have a comfort in my soul that maybe they're not sharing. I have a brother at home. His name is Eli. And... I don't believe he's saved. You know, he's had the gospel presented to him sometimes. I'm on one hand, I'm praying that maybe for just a second, maybe for just a second he believed. But right now he does not. He is not a professing Christian and therefore I believe and am led to act on the requirement that he is an unsaved soul. That my brother, who I love very much, is doomed for hell. And and that's what it is. That's what that's what it means. You know, you got it. You have to more than you're ashamed of being a Christian when you know you shouldn't be, and you're ready to conquer it, and you're scared. But more than you're ashamed, you should fear hell for the other soul in front of you. Amen. Because, like I said before, until they're saved, they are dead men walking this earth. That's they right. are right. going to right. wake up one day in eternal torment, that's right. forever fire, rest of their lives. It's an awful thought. And like I said, you know, you have wonderful memories with some of these people. And you have wonderful memories with your your father and your mother and your 
yeah. son, daughter, wife, husband, all of that, and you love and cherish this person enough, and are you really going to let that keep you, are you going, are you going to let that shame keep you from introducing that person to the glory of Christ? Yeah, or trying again after they brushed you off, yeah. or trying again after they said, I really need to go to work right now, this, this can wait. Or trying again after they just reply a snarl remark, or try again after they threaten you, possibly in your own home. It's tough. Amen. And I know that, you know, we're not we're not supposed to dwell on the people we don't win. You know? That if we get shrugged off, you know, dust off our boots and off to the next house, off to the next soul. But you gotta grow a burden for people's souls. That's right. Yeah. It's yeah. life or death yeah. for the opposing. It was life or death for you. And you got saved. You have life forever. So it's going to be life or death for that same person. Or it's going to be death for that same person until they're saved. Yeah. That's yeah. what that means. Yeah. And I want to cycle back. I want to cycle back to the, to the stranger. I want to cycle back to the stranger that you might never see again. And, but the fact is, and you know, and they're a stranger for a reason. You've never seen that person. You don't know anything about that person. Talking to them is going to be a dice roll on infinite personalities, infinite uh, backstories, right, right. infinite things that went right or wrong that particular day. And But that doesn't matter. Talk to them because Christ told you to. There you go. And, and I'm not perfect. You know, preaching this message, I feel like the biggest hypocrite in the room because... As far as I'm concerned right now, I think I am. But that's a, that, that's a thing. You know, this is edification to myself as much as I hope it is for any of you. But that's the point. But you think, you, you take that risk. You see that person. And instead of this time, you don't leave them. So you don't need to dwell on the what if I did. The what if I did. What's happening to them now. What's going on in their lives now. Instead... We can, <clears throat> instead, you know, we take we take that step to receive that person. That's right. To try and win them to Christ. Amen, brother. To try and let them hear what we have to say. Let them hear what Christ has to say for us. Christ has to say through us, because that's another big thing. Is you know, you can you can be ready for all the answers. You know, you you uh, that's that's one burden of a Christian is. You become a newborn Christian, and now you have to learn. Now you have to study because you're afraid that if you walk out of church after that morning, you get saved, and you tell someone you get saved that isn't saved, and they're going to ask you a Bible question, and you have no clue what to answer. And that's a burden that weighs on us all. But the fact is, is at its basic, Christ didn't tell us upon preaching the gospel, he didn't tell us to prepare for these paradoxes, you know, one one people like to throw out, uh, can God himself make a rock that he can't move? Who cares? God's above that. Amen. Amen. You know, and we go we go and step to this person and we take a chance and tell them because if we, if we don't if we don't make sure that person hears, how are we going to know? Romans 10, 17 reads, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How are they going to have faith if they never had a chance to hear the word of God? How are you going to know that they've heard the word of God if you're not going to go in yourself and make sure that they've heard it? That you're going to go in and make sure that they at least have an opportunity and you know, and they may, they may still reject you, but you still gave it a shot. You did what you were supposed to do because it's not your words that deals with them. It's the Holy Ghost. Amen. And like I said before, you know, my grandfather was the first person to introduce me to the gospel and I didn't get saved, but it planted a seed. Amen. It made me, it, it made me, I bet that seed planted me into a position where I would not be here today if it wasn't for that starting line because who knows how drastically my life would have changed if I didn't have that starting line if I didn't have that initial response. Amen. Amen. But you think more about talking to these people and another famous one that they like to bring up is, you know, what about the heathen who doesn't know? That they go all their life without hearing the word of God and they die. What happens to them? They never got a chance. Well, one answer is, you're the laborers. That is our responsibility. We are the chance for these people. That's right. But the other, you know, the other answer that you've heard here before is, well, now you're the heathen that does know, so what are you going to do about it? That's the truth. 
<clears throat> but 